Hey everyone, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold here at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with a sponsored uh, lecture on the Queen's Gambit by Anonymous. Now normally when somebody uh, offers money for a lecture and they say they want to be anonymous, then we, you know, we abide by that. But actually the, the name is Anonymous. It's very strange. I've never had somebody named Anonymous uh, give us... But anyway, so today's lecture will be on the Queen's Gambit. Probably I could make a 20-hour video series on the Queen's Gambit. So maybe this lecture is not going to do it justice. But basically what I'm going to talk about are the possible variations that encompass the Queen's Gambit. And I'll even tell you where there's a little argument because maybe... Some people would call it the Queen's Gambit, and some people wouldn't. And then I've been playing white in the Queen's Gambit my whole life. And when I was a kid, between the ages, I would say, 9 and 16, I played black in the Queen's Gambit, and then I sort of gave it up because it wasn't... I, I like to have white in the Queen's Gambit, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the variations and games in the Queen's Gambit, starting right here. All right, so what we're going to do is I have four different positions. And by positions, three of them are my games from before you were born. I wonder if I was born yet. I think I was born. And the first thing we're going to do is see what the Queen's Gambit is. And that depends on what your definition of is is. So we'll, we'll find out. Okay, so a lot of people who don't play chess um, or are like super beginners they think the queen's gambit must be where you gambit your queen, but not really. The queen's gambit, the idea is to gambit a queenside pawn, which you try to win back later in the hopes of gaining control of the center. So this is the starting position of the queen's gambit, although you could actually transpose and get to these positions another way. And by another way, I mean many other ways. So just as an aside, when Karpov played Korshnoi in 1978 and 1981 for the World Chess Championship, when Korshnoi was white, a lot of times he would play the English opening and Karpov wanted to play the Queen's Gambit with black. So he would play E6 and then D5 and they would transpose to the Queen's Gambit. And there's many ways to do that as long as the pieces and pawns stay on the same square. However, the original Queen's Gambit is this position. Now, Grandmasters play several moves here. The three most common are E6, which we'll, we'll be discussing today, C6, which is the Slav, and D takes C4, which is the Queen's Gambit accepted. And Queen's Gambit accepted is very common today. It's always been pretty common. And the point of the Queen's Gambit from White's point of view is to give away the C pawn, get rid of Black's D pawn. You can see Black's D pawn isn't there anymore and try to get the center with either E4 or, or E3 at some point. Let's play E4 just to show you. And if Black plays a bad move, there's plenty of bad moves. Let's play that one. Then we take our pawn back and you can see white has this great center. Conversely, um, there's the king's gambit, which you've heard of, with the same idea. It's a little more dangerous because we're opening up our king. The king's gambit, we're trying to get rid of the e pawn so we can play d4 and have a big center. Okay, so like this would be similar. I'll play a, a bad move for black. Okay, another bad move for black. And you can see white has a nice center. White got his pawn back. And white gave up a side pawn for center pawn. That's the point of the queen's gambit and the king's gambit. Okay. Now, uh, if you play the queen's gambit, um, I like the way I accidentally played another opening, Albin counter gambit. If you, if you play the queen's gambit um, position, I'm trying to get rid of these things. I got to click off the board. Okay. I haven't lectured in a while. I think uh, if you play the queen's gambit, either with white or black, you're not going to get it very often. And this is the problem non-professional players have with studying the opening, is professional players 
who play chess for a living and they're top five, top 10, top 20 in the world, they're studying chess all the time. And the general population, normal person isn't studying chess 14 hours a day. They do other stuff. So when you're studying openings like the Queen's Gambit, you need to realize no matter how many chess games you play, you're not going to have a lot of the opening you want. So for example, let's say you want to have black in the Queen's Gambit and you're like, oh boy, I've been studying the Queen's Gambit for black. I'm ready for everything. Well, if your opponent plays E4 on move one every game, you're never going to have a Queen's Gambit. If your opponent plays B3 on move one or G3 or Knight C3 or D3 or E3 or F4, you only have the Queen's Gambit when you have the Queen's Gambit. And nowadays, the London is becoming very popular for white. So people are playing Bishop F4 or, or Knight F3 and then Bishop F4. And you're again, you're not going to have a Queen's Gambit. So when you study openings, if you're not a professional player, it's easy to forget what you studied if it doesn't happen all the time. Now, luckily, I'm really old. So when I say luckily, it's lucky for the purposes of this lecture, basically not for anything else. But the reason it's good I'm old is if I've played the Queen's Gambit for 40 years, for example, it doesn't matter if I have it very often because I've been having it for 40 years. So even if I only have 10 games a year, that's still 400 games. Okay, and I have this position quite often because this is the most common way for me to play with white, d4, and if I face d5, then c4. Okay, now we break down the queen's gambit into the queen's gambit accepted and the queen's gambit declined. Now, first, the queen's gambit accepted, d takes c4, the idea is white is going to try to get his pawn back and build a big center. And the one trap that you need to know, whether you're white or black, is if you play e3 to win your pawn back, and your opponent doesn't want to give the pawn back. Now, grandmasters just give the pawn back and they develop in castle. But if you're playing somebody who wants to keep their pawn, you attack the B pawn and A6 doesn't defend it because there's a, there's a pin going on here. You can't, you can't take back. So if black plays C6 with the same idea, this is a very famous trap. And now queen F3 and the rook has nowhere to go and black's going to lose either a knight, a bishop, or a rook, depending on what he wants to lose. If he wants to lose a bishop, he can play bishop e7. If he wants to lose a knight, he can play knight c6. If he wants to lose a rook, he can lose a rook. Probably they're all bad choices. Okay, now, when I was a kid, that's when I learned chess, and I was a beginner, and I didn't like being down a pawn ever. So when I played the queen's gambit, since e3 is the best way to get the pawn back quickly. That's what I played, and that's what I play today. You can also play e4 or knight f3, and there's some variations where black does everything he can to defend this pawn, doesn't castle, doesn't develop his pieces, just keeps you know, defending that pawn at any cost, and white gets a big center, and white gets development. Grandmasters don't do that. They just develop in castle, and white eventually gets his pawn back. Okay, now, black can also play e6, which is the queen's gambit declined, although not yet. Because now, it's very common at the top level, probably more common than the queen's gambit now, is to play the Catalan. The difference between the queen's gambit and the Catalan is the move g3. If white's playing g3, the first five or six moves, that's the Catalan. If white never plays g3, that's the queen's gambit. White's getting his bishop out some other way. At the top level, it's very common to play the Catalan, where you're fianchettoing your bishop. And this position is in thousands and thousands of grandmaster games. I wouldn't call this a queen's gambit. I would call this a Catalan, because white fianchettoed his bishop. So since it's not a Catalan lecture, we'll talk about that. Now, white can play knight c3 or knight f3, to keep within the confines of the queen's gambit. I play knight c3. Some grandmasters play knight f3, and here's why. Well, first of all, they might transpose to a Catalan, but if black decides to play the Tarash variation with c5, okay, 
And that's not very common nowadays, but okay, it's Kasparov used to play it all the time in the 80s. And you take on d5, there's a very tricky move. <clears throat> I know it's Karen's favorite, the Von Henning Shara Gambit, right? And we could use a trillion dollars. So if she goes with the okay, the Von Henning Shara Gambit is black doesn't take back on d5, but takes on d4. Now, this is not dangerous in the least bit if White's Knight isn't on c3. If White's Knight is on b1 and White's Knight is on f3, then that black's not attacking anything. And I don't mind having white here, but some people do. They don't like this gambit. It's too complicated. I, I don't have that problem, so that's fine. If you want something really complicated and sharp and you have the black pieces, you can do hours of analysis on this position. Okay, and that's the Tarash. Most strong grandmasters just, just take back. Okay, and we got the, the Tarash position of the queen's gambit. And if white doesn't like that gambit, he can just play knight f3, and then after c5 take, and this doesn't attack the knight, so it doesn't matter. Okay, now, some grandmasters who play white in the queen's gambit want to delay playing knight f3 because they want to play knight e2 in different kinds of situations. So what's funny is I almost never play knight e2, but I still play knight c3 first. All right, so knight c3 is the main move. Now, between like 1850 and 1950, everybody played knight f6, which is fine. And nowadays, because of Tigran Petrosian and work of players after him, people are playing bishop e7. And that stops bishop g5, obviously. And if white wants to continue playing the queen's gambit and get his bishop out, not play e3 blocking his queen bishop, he usually plays knight f3, usually. Then after knight f6, black doesn't have to worry about lines where white's putting the knight on e2 later because white already played knight f3. And also, black's already to castle. So m most grandmasters play bishop e7 before they play knight f6. You can play either one, but if you're, if you're not going to play bishop e7 and your intention is, I'm going to play bishop b4, or I'm going to play the Cambridge Springs, then you, you wouldn't play bishop e7, okay? Because that's, that's different. Again, that's up to you. They're just different variations. Now, after bishop g5, which is what I play, black can play knight bd7 or bishop e7. Bishop e7 is mainly what we're going to talk about today because that's most of my games. Knight bd7 is the start of the Cambridge Springs, and this is a very well-known trap. You've probably seen it before. If white decides to take a pawn, because you see that knight is pinned, right? Okay, the problem is the knight is pinned, but you should still take the knight. This is a known blunder. And after takes, bishop b4 check wins the queen back, because white has to play queen d2. And if you count the pieces, you'll notice black has an extra piece. Black has three minor pieces and white only has two. So the Cambridge spring starts with knight bd7. Black is not intending to play bishop e7. We play e3, knight f3, queen a5. And there was a tournament, I believe it was 1904, in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. And many of the games started like this. And white has two moves. White can take on d5, which is the preferred super GM move or knight d2, which is what I play. And obviously, you, know, you see this pin. Sometimes the queen is attacking the bishop. The knight can go to e4. The bishop can go to b4. It's good if you know this. And this is the Cambridge Springs. It's not very popular now. Not many grandmaster games. But, you know, in the early 1900s, this was a very common opening. Okay, obviously, black has a problem with this. And the main theme of the queen's gambit, from white's point of view, where white's very happy is this bishop has a big, has a lot of problems. You can see because of the pawn structure, that's, that's a tough bishop. And conversely, my bishop is outside my pawn chain, so my bishops have good squares. That's something I get a lot when I'm white in a queen's gambit. Okay, but the main move, which we'll be looking at a lot today, is, is bishop to e7. Okay, and this is the queen's gambit. It's all the queen's gambit. 
There's different variations of the Queen's Gambit. And for me, when I play a Queen's Gambit, uh, I'm either having this position a lot, this is the move order, or if my opponent played Bishop E7, um, then I get this position a lot. And since about 95% of the time I play Knight F3, I, it doesn't matter to me, I'm getting the same position. Now, at the super grandmaster level, a lot of grandmasters are like, well, I can't play bishop g5 now, so I'm going to play the bishop f4 variation of the queen's gambit, and my opponents already played bishop e7. So if they ever play bishop d6 to trade bishops, they're losing a tempo. And this is a very common position also. I've never had this position in a slow game because I don't play bishop f4 in the queen's gambit. That's not what I do. However, you can play bishop f4 in the queen's gambit without trading on d5, okay? And usually you play knight f3 first and bishop f4. And if you were following a lot of the local, a lot of the recent online chess with all these super GM tournaments, you, you saw this position a lot, okay? If you see my games, you're not going to see this position because I play bishop g5. But it's, it's a small difference. And you get the same kinds of pawn structure sometimes with the piece placement being a little bit different. And I'm not adverse with my bishop on g5 to taking this knight um, and playing that position where I put my pawns on dark squares and my dark square bishop is gone, so it's not blockaded by anything. Okay, so um, let's... We did a little intro. We could do several more hours of intro because the Queen's Gambit is a cornucopia of different variations, but let's, let's go to a game or two. Okay. Let's look at a game that I played a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay. So we'll do full screen because that's the most fun you can have. Okay. And then we'll make it even fuller. All right. That's, that's the greatest thing that ever happened. Okay. This is a game that I played in 2009 at the U.S. Open in Indianapolis. And the one thing I've learned from chess, right? Now, hopefully Karen remembers this. It's a very important chess lesson. Don't go to Indianapolis. Okay, there, there you go, okay? As a chess player, you travel a lot and you sort of learn where to go and where not to go. So if you can avoid Indianapolis, I would recommend it because, you know, it's, don't go there. Okay, now this game was played early in the tournament. I was rated 2,500 something and my opponent was about 2,200, okay? And this game was played 11 years ago, and I'm white in a queen's gambit. I don't know why I played knight f3. That's not something I usually do, but we get this position, which I get a lot. Okay. Now, a lot of super grandmasters today will play the Catalan or the bishop f4 queen's gambit because they no longer believe white's getting a big advantage in the queen's gambit main lines because black can play either the Tartar Cow or the Lasker defense and probably equalize. I don't mind if my opponent's equal or slightly worse as long as it's a position that I like. Most super grandmasters, most, who are studying chess all day, they don't want to study chess all day, day after day after day, go to a chess tournament, and after move 12 have an equal position. They're, they're studying chess all day, so they get a big opening advantage. That's, you know... I'm not doing that. I want a tiny advantage, a position that I like. Okay, I like white in this position. If other grandmasters think black's equal, that's fine. They can think that. Okay, so he played knight bd7, which is the orthodox variation. The Lasker variation, the Tartar Cower, both start with h6. And I'm sure we'll see that in a future game. And there, white can retreat the bishop, or which I used to do, or you can take, which is what I currently do. Okay, he played knight bd7. I played queen c2, which is what I play. You can also play rook c1. I've played that. You can play bishop to d3. You can do anything, but okay. Queen c2, I might castle queen side. I might not. Okay, protect e4. c6. I play rook to d1. If black never plays c5 and never plays e5, the bishop's not very good. If black eventually plays c5 or e5, I want my rook opposite his queen. That's the point of queen c2 and rook d1. If I was in a friskier mood, maybe I'd castle queen side. But 
B6, he realizes his bishop isn't very good. So, you know, he tries to get his bishop out. Another way of playing is to take on C4 and then put the knight on D5 and start trading things. I like when they take on C4 when my bishop hasn't moved yet because that way I can get to C4 in one move instead of bishop out and then takes. And save a tempo, which is what I did now. Okay, castles. And he played rook C8. So this is very solid, pretty passive for black, but you know, it's okay. And I played rook E1 because I'm playing very solid also. And he played H6. Could also consider playing C5. I took and... The problem is, whichever way he takes, he has sort of an issue. If he takes with a bishop, he's not defending the e4 square. If he takes with a knight, he's giving me the e5 square for my knight. So either way, you know, I have some advantage there. He took with the knight. I played e4, and we traded. Okay. And basically, the idea of this position, and many positions like it, is, is black going to play c5, or black's never going to play c5? If black plays c5 and I don't have a forced win, black's doing fine. If black never plays c5, then that, that bishop's no good. So now it's hard to play c5 because my rook's opposite your queen. So I have some tactical tricks, obviously. Okay, so you took. And obviously can't play c5 now because his c pawn's pinned. Okay, now he, now he can play c5. But it's not his turn. So I played c5. And this move in different positions gives up the d5 square to his knight, but he doesn't have a knight. So I didn't mind that. And it also might weaken my d pawn. My d pawn's pretty well protected. So I'm giving up the idea of playing d5 and busting open the center, but I've just killed his bishop on b7. I don't see how that bishop ever gets good, ever. Ever. Okay. So I think I've won the battle of the opening. My position looks pretty good. His position's pretty solid. And he has two bishops, but his bishop on b7. Okay, he plays rook in the middle. I defended my c pawn some more. Okay, I played knight e5. Because it's time to go on the attack. When I see my opponent's pieces over here, I think about attacking their king. And uh, in this position... He took on b4, which I think is a blunder because um, I play check. And this is funny. If he plays king h8, knight takes f7 as mate. Pretty unusual. So he has to play king f8. And this is why I played knight e5. Now, I'd like to say something. As This isn't really related to the queen's gambit, but it's going to improve your chess. I'm a much higher rated player than my opponent. So... When I give up my b-pawn with knight e5, I have a reason. I got something going on. And if he thought long enough and said, what does my opponent have? What am I missing? I think he would have found it. But he didn't find it. And he was like, man, that b-pawn, I can just take that. I mean, I'm not giving my b-pawn away. He just played a5. So if knight e5 didn't win, I would probably just play a3 and defend my queen side. When I played knight e5, I knew he couldn't take my pawn. Otherwise, I wouldn't play 95, but he took my pawn anyway, so he didn't believe me. And after the game, I gave him a cassette of uh, a cassette of the monkeys for obvious reasons. Right, Karen? Yeah. Now he's a believer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I guess cassette made, well, maybe 8-track. Okay, so bishop check. And now you should always look for your opponent's checks and captures, right? So I played knight takes f7, destroying his king side. Now, he can't take my knight, but he did anyway. If he doesn't take my knight, I'm threatening his rook, and my knight can go back to e5, and he's just getting crushed. So he took the knight, right, and the game ended very quickly. And queen takes e6, threatens queen g8 mate. He found a good defense to queen g8 mate. He resigned. That stopped queen g8 mate, right? Now, could also play king e8, which stops queen g8 mate, and then I, and then I made him this way. Okay, but among other things that win. So here he resigned. Um, usually when I play the Queen's Gambit with white, I'm not checkmating my opponent in 20 moves, but I got an attack because his bishop never got out and he was trying to get 
queenside counterplay, and he ignored the kingside. So that was one of my better games because it was clean and I won pretty easily. I got all my pieces out. And my opponent was very passive that game. It was very rare that he moved a minor piece past the third row. In fact, I don't remember him doing that or any piece. He moved a pawn past the third row, but he didn't move his knights and bishops and queens and stuff. Okay, so that was a nice win for me. Let's continue, always continue. Okay, and let's see, and I go to this and I click that. As long as I click everything, we're all good. All right. Okay, let me go back here for a second. Okay, always, never going back, always go back. Okay, now this game was played in Michigan at the Michigan Open. And it was, I think, the last round, if I remember correctly. And my opponent's 2,200, so it's Queen's Gambit, okay, as explained. All right. And my opponent played H6, which I talked about earlier. And I took the knight, which is what I do. I used to play Bishop H4. I'm not sure which move is more common now. They, they play both of them. Okay. And here, Rook C1 is the main move. And I play Queen D2. I usually play Queen D2. That was played in a Karpov-Kasparov match. And I looked at the game a lot. And it's not very common. But I play Rook C1 also. Okay. And the idea is, again, this Bishop's not very good. I want to stop C5 and E5. So I'm really lined up here against his queen and this pawn. If he never plays c5, he never plays e5, his bishop's no good. Okay, and he ends it up playing the move e5. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, in this position, I played bishop f7 check, which is a move that I know from a tall game. And I think if two supercomputers were playing, probably not the best move, but it's very interesting. Now, the tactical reason that black can play e5 is in this position. If I take the knight, he takes my queen with check and then takes my knight. Obviously, he's fine here. And if I take his queen first, then he takes my knight with check and then takes the queen, and he's fine here. So even though his bishop is overworked, his bishop is defending his knight and his queen, it's, it's still okay. Now, that's the point of bishop f7 check. If he takes with the rook, if, now his knight's pinned. He's not, he's not defending his queen sufficiently. So he can't take with the knight, and I'm attacking his bishop. And if his bishop moves, I have e6 forking. So this is good for white. So you have to take with the king, okay? And then I take. And you can't take with the knight like you could in the previous position because I take with check. And previously when I showed you this variation, the black, the black king was on G8. So you could play queen takes queen check, but you're in check. So if you take and then white's, white's ahead material. Okay, so after it takes, he has to play bishop e7 and white's down a piece for two pawns, but black's king looks a little silly and I got his knight pinned on d7. His queen side looks bad. So basically, if you're two humans, it's very tricky. And I don't know who's going to win. Two supercomputers, maybe they would take black. Okay. And I play queen c2. Um, that way, if his king goes back, I have e6. And I'm pinning his knight. If his king doesn't go back, then his king can stay there. That's good. And I have queen b3 check or queen h7. Keep your king there where I want it. <clears throat> okay, he played queen b6. I played e6 check, which forces him to take it if he doesn't want to lose at least a piece. And I play queen check. And you can see, even if an engine said black can play perfectly and defend, this isn't fun for black. And I think here I'm already doing pretty well. And I think rook f6 is actually the losing move. I think he has to play bishop f6 so his king can walk back to d8. King on e6 isn't very good. Okay. And now his king is sort of stuck on, on e6, which isn't, that's not good. Okay. So I want to play knight d4 check. He took my knight, sacrificing the exchange. Now I can't play knight d4 check. 
All right. And the reason my position is good here isn't because I'm mating him. Because he sacked the exchange and because I took all his kingside pawns, he's not really a head material, right? I have four pass pawns and I have a rook and three pawns for two pieces. These obviously are really bad. King is bad. I can castle if I want to make my king safe. And his king is you know, it's not good. Okay, he took a pawn. His knight spinned. My king is walking to safety. And queen h5 loses immediately, but he's already lost here. And now I have a very nice win based on an overworked, overloaded theme. The bishop is defending d6 and f6. So rook d6 check. And queen takes. And oh, it doesn't matter what he does. I'm taking all his pieces. And here I have a very nice checkmate. Every move wins, but I made it the quickest way, which is knight c3. It doesn't matter where his king moves. C c4, c5, and queen d4 is made. If his king was on c4, queen d4 is also made. So that was a nice attacking game by me also. And again, with as is in the first game, black has problems with these pieces, right? Those pieces are sort of stuck on the queen side. That's a problem that black has in the queen's gambit is usually his pawns are on white squares and he has trouble getting his white squared bishop out. These things happen to the best of us. Okay, last game but not least. And this is the oldest of the games I'm going to show you. That's saying something. This was played in the U.S. Junior Championship. And the game is so old, even I wasn't born yet. I don't even understand that's possible. Okay, so um, my FIDE rating, or my U.S., no, my FIDE was 2345. I think my opponent was like 2250 USCF. And we got a Queen's Gambit again. This is by transposition, which I told you at the beginning of the video it doesn't have to go the move order. That's the standard move order. It could be another move order. And I get this a lot too. I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be a Nimzo Indian. And then bam, it's a Queen's Gambit. Okay, he plays d5. All right. Then we get our Queen's Gambit position. There we go. Okay. And again, I, I play Queen d2. Um, rook c1 is definitely the most common move. Queen b3 is a move. Bishop d3 is a move. Okay. It doesn't, it's not a big difference what you play. And again, my opponent has, you know, an issue with this bishop. He took on c4. I took back. I love doing that. I love when my bishop's on f1 and I take on c4. Not as good as when I move my bishop to e2 or d3. Then they take on c4 and I got to move it again. <sighs> but I didn't have to move it again here, so that was good. Rook d1, e5. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken... Actually, I think I am mistaken. No, maybe I'm not mistaken. This might be the same as the last game, except this game was played before. You know where I play bishop f7 check? Pretty sure it's the exact same position where I play bishop f7 check. Okay. And I play d5, which is another move. And the idea is I have the e4 square for my knight, which is good, and his bishop's not very good blocked by this pawn. He played rook e8. He wants to play e4. I'm like, no, you, you can't play e4. And I, I was really proud of bishop b3 because b5 gains a tempo and knight b6 gains a tempo. So I go here first. He played knight b6 anyway, and I played d6. Obviously, I can't play d6 if my bishop's on c4 because he can take it. So that's why I like that I play bishop b3 first. He took, I took. And I'm threatening knight takes rook, and I'm threatening bishop takes pawn. So obviously white has a nice position here. And he did play e5, so his bishop can get out. Unlike the other games where the bishop never got out. Rook e7 defending the pawn. I castled. He got his bishop out. And I played queen b4, attacking his bishop. And he went back. Now, the other thing he didn't like is... In this position, I can't really, I, whoa, I can't really attack his queen with my rook because I got the queen in the way by playing queen before. Now, if I make any knight move, I'm attacking his queen with my rook on d1. He didn't like that. Obviously, I'm threatening his bishop also. So he played bishop d7 so that he wouldn't, he wouldn't be pinned here anymore. I played knight back to e4. Now I'm pinning his bishop. And I'm threatening to mess his pawns up. 
He attacked my queen, which is a blunder. I took with check. He played here. And I played queen e4. And he missed the point of queen e4. And this is a very common mistake that, you know, non-grandmasters make. And sometimes grandmasters too. Is your opponent makes a move. And you're like, aha, this is why he played the move, right? Okay, just like odd job, aha. And then you do whatever you have to do to prevent the threats of that move. But actually there's another threat, but you didn't see it. So the obvious threat is I take on b7, okay? He saw that. And he's like, well, I can, I'll defend that later. I'll play a4 attacking his bishop, okay? But actually I have another threat, which is more important than taking on b7. Do you see my other threat? If you don't, you can pause the video and try to figure it out. The other threat is, since this is pinned, I got queen g6 check. And then, then it's over, because I take everything with check. And he didn't see that. He played a4. He thought I moved my bishop away, but I played queen g6 check. So that was many different games and positions from the queen's gambit. I hope you enjoyed that lecture. I know I did, because I got to show some games I won for a change. Uh, hopefully I'll be lecturing more in the near future. And maybe at some point we'll even have an audience across fingers. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page here. Click on things that, you know, help us out. Don't forget to donate. Some of you forget that. And I'm signing off from the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. And I'll see you guys on the stream. Bye, everyone.